chapter 24. We will read verses 45 through 51 tonight. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour that he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Tonight we conclude the text of Matthew 24, and I think this will be the end of this series, and we will not have church next week, and then we will pick back up with a new series uh, in two weeks. Tonight ends Matthew 24, even though Jesus will go on in Matthew 25 and, and continue his dialogue about his coming through parables, we're going to stop our series tonight. In our text tonight, Jesus is laying out a challenge to human beings. In regards to His second coming and what human beings are supposed to be while He is away. What I want to do tonight, what my heart's desire, what my prayer is for us tonight, is for us to experience that challenge in our hearts. I don't want us tonight to simply go away and say, that's what the text says. I want us to leave here tonight and ask the question of ourselves, am I experiencing, am I being, am I doing what it is that Jesus says I'm supposed to be doing while he's gone? And if we don't leave here with that, then we have failed. We've wasted our time. Because what Jesus is doing at the end of this is he's not simply telling the disciples, hey, you don't know when I'm going to come, or hey, the temple's going to be this. He's now looking at his disciples and presenting them a challenge. Telling them, here's what you're supposed to be while I'm gone. And so what I want us to do tonight is I want that challenge to come and pierce our hearts. And so to do that, I think we need to walk through what the faithful and wise servant is and walk through what the wicked servant is and test ourselves and see what our attitude is. Before I go into the details of the faithful and wicked servants, I want to say a few general words about these two. So I'm going to go into details. I've got three points for the faithful servant, three points for the wicked servant. But what I want to do before that is I want to speak in general about the faithful and wicked servant. Both of these servants claim to be true servants. Both of these servants in this, this story that Jesus is telling, both claim to really be servants of the master. But their actions are going to reveal whether or not that is true. Their actions, the way that they live, is going to reveal whether or not the master is truly their master and if they are true servants of their master. Now, most people think that being a Christian means accepting Jesus as your Savior. In fact, that's what we teach little kids often, do we not? Do we not tell them, ask Jesus in your heart to be your Savior? If that is all that a person believes, have they become a Christian? No, they have not. That is why it is very important for us when we're teaching our little kids about what salvation is and what being a Christian is. It is not simply taking Jesus to be your Savior. Because there's more to salvation than simply taking Jesus to be your Savior. There's more to it. Being a Christian is not simply being saved from your sin, but surrendering to Jesus as your Lord. That's why we say to accept Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. If you simply come to Him to be Savior and not Lord, you have not experienced salvation. Salvation is lordship salvation. 
If you don't come to Jesus to surrender your life, then you have not been saved. Jesus said, follow me. Not just, hey, I'll forgive your sins. You can go about and do whatever you want after that. Follow me. Do what I'm calling you to do. That's what it means to be a Christian. Cheat grace, as Diedrich Bonhoeffer called it, says that lordship is not important. That discipleship is not a necessity. We just simply get grace to be saved and how we live doesn't matter. That is not salvation. Salvation is save me and change me because the way that I live really matters. It really matters. A person who calls themselves a Christian because they have, they have accepted Jesus as Savior but has no desire and makes no attempt to surrender to Him as Lord has never been saved. Yeah, that's right. See why it's important for us to make sure we don't just tell our kids to ask Jesus in your heart? Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's all. That's all. If, oh, well, who, who doesn't want to ask Jesus in their heart and not go to hell? Yeah. Right. What four-year-old kid would not say the sinner's prayer? I could scare any four-year-old into saying that prayer. What we want, and here's what happens. We pray that prayer. Then all of a sudden we get older and we realize, I don't have a clue what I was doing. I don't have a, I have a clue what it meant. So from the time that we begin presenting the gospel to people, whether it is a four-year-old or a 104-year-old, the gospel must be proclaimed as who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and our responsibility... To repent and to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. When Jesus makes someone a Christian, he is going to save that person of their sin. No doubt about it. He then is going to lead their lives and change who they are. Forgiveness of sin without surrendering to Christ's Lordship does not exist. You can't get forgiven if you're not surrendering to Him as Lord. Right. It's not going to happen. It's not true salvation. We live in a world, we live in a culture of cheap grace. Mm -hmm. If you want to read more about that, read The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Cheap grace, where we simply come to God we get our fire insurance, we get forgiven of our sin, and there is no desire in our lives to let Christ then lead us, no desire for us to follow Him, that lack of desire proves that you never got forgiven. Right. God doesn't give cheap grace. No. The grace that He gives changes people. And then He says, follow me. Come after me. I think we're going to see this in the text tonight. Because both of, these, both of these servants claim to be servants. They both say, oh no, we're true servants of the master. But we got two radical different views of lordship here. One could care less, and one, the faithful and wise. So let's point out, first, the three attributes that are here in the text. At least the three that I want to mention tonight and that kind of jumped out at me. These three attributes of a faithful servant. Number one. Called to action. Called to action. Notice that the servant is not described as a person who has faith. Do you see that? It doesn't say the servant who has faith. It says a faithful servant. And you may be thinking, well, what is the difference between a servant who has faith and a faithful servant? Well, the person here, this this servant is being described as one who is acting in a certain way. This servant acts a certain way. It's not just that he has faith, it's that he acts a certain way. The true servant has actions that are evidence that he truly submits to the master. He is a faithful servant. That word faithful has, is referring to the, the manner in which he lives. The manner in which this servant conducts himself is in a faithful way. It's a faithful servant. You might think from the last analogy of the thief, you might think 
that we are to just sit back and wait for the Lord to come as if our job is passive, right? Jesus coming back, we're the thief, and we're in the house, and we're just waiting for him to come back. Jesus wants to make sure in this text that that's not our attitude. That we're not just in the house and the thief's going to come and our job is just to sit there and wait. Jesus then moves us from that anticipation of him coming to then get us to be active in the way that we live. And that's why he says the faithful servant, the one who does action, the one who is participating and being active, not the one who just sits back and is passive. Jesus is getting rid of the idea that, that as he is gone, we are to just be passively waiting for him. No, the true servant is a person of action. So the first thing is he's a faithful servant. He's a person of action. He's a servant of action. Call to action. Number two, call to submission. The faithful person does not determine for himself what he should be faithful to. In other words, he does not get to choose what he will follow. He is told what he is supposed to do, and the faithful servant submits to what he's told he's supposed to do. Look at the text. It says, The faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Find so doing what? Doing exactly what the master said. The master said, here's when they get their food. When he comes back, the faithful servant is giving the food when the master said the food should be given. This servant is submissive to the master. The master's the one who sets the rules. The master's the one who is, determines how things are supposed to go. And the faithful servant submits to the master as the master lays out. You know, well, I'll save our discussion of our culture for the wicked servant. The true servant is one who follows Jesus as his master, as his Lord, allows Jesus to call the shots. Let Jesus lay down the rules and simply follows him in submission. That's what the faithful servant does. Says, you are Lord and I am not Lord. You lay down the rules, I don't lay down the rules. You set the standard, not me. You tell me what to do. The food should be out at this time. Then that's when the food should get out. This is all about humility, is it not? It's all about humility. Only someone who humbles himself would be willing to say to the master, whatever you say. Not thinking more of yourself than you should. Not trusting yourself to know what you are to do. But trusting that Jesus, the master of the household, knows what you ought to do. My goodness, I do not trust myself to tell me what to do. I do not trust myself. If God said to me, I'm going to go away, Neil, you just do what you think is right. I'll make a mess of everything. That's why Jesus tells us, here's what you're supposed to be about. Here's how you're supposed to live. Here's what you're supposed to do. And the faithful servant humbly submits and says, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. What would you have us do? Third, call to action, call to submission, call to wisdom. It says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant? We are called to wisdom. Wisdom has been defined properly by many throughout the ages as a proper application of what you know. Knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom is the proper application of that which you know. You can know a whole bunch of stuff. I've met a lot of people who know a whole bunch of stuff and they are fools. Yeah. So wisdom is simply not knowing things, but, but wisdom is taking what you know and then properly applying it to the situation that God has put you in. Jesus expects his true servants to act in this world with wisdom. With wisdom. We are to not be foolish. We are to not live as fools. We are to live in wisdom. 
to take what we know to be true, to live out what we know to be true, for everyone to see. That sounds awfully familiar, Brother James. I think you may have said that this morning. <laughs> take what we know, live what we know, and live it for everybody to see. That's what the wise person does. He doesn't just take what he, he doesn't just know something. He takes what he knows and he applies it to his life and he lives it. And Jesus wants us to be servants who are not only faithful, but wise. The servant who does these things, the servant who, who is about the actions that the Lord lays down and he submits to those, the master lays down, and so he submits to what the, the master tells him to do. And he's wise in how he goes about fulfilling his calling and doing what the master tells him to do. This servant proves that he has genuine faith. There's no, by the way, there's no mention in the text of the servant having faith. It doesn't say the true servant is the servant who has faith. You know why he doesn't have to say that? Because only one with genuine faith acts this way. Only one that has genuine faith will, will want to act in accordance with that faith. Only one that has genuine faith will humble himself to the Lordship of Christ. Only one that has genuine faith has a desire to live in godly wisdom in the world. So these actions prove that this servant has true faith. And when Jesus comes back and he finds this servant living this way, look at what he says. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Wow. Wow. Now, let's just jump out of that analogy for a minute. What does Jesus own? Everything. He, he owns it because he created it, but he also, he doubly owns it. How else does Jesus earn the right to own everything? Because he came as a man, lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross, and as a an assurance and approval of this manhood of Jesus, God the Father raised him from the dead. Jesus owns everything as God and man. That just blows my mind. Yeah. Jesus owns this world as a man, not only as God, as both. Because he did, he, he came and lived in perfect dominion. He, he came and did exactly what the first Adam failed to do, did exactly what Israel failed to do. He came and accomplished and did it exactly, and the Father says, you are the man who inherits the earth. You are my firstborn son, right? That's the analogy that's given. Jesus is the first from among the dead. Jesus inherits everything. The Father turns to Jesus and says, here, you get everything. And what does Jesus do? What does this benevolent, gracious, merciful, first oldest son do? What does he do? He turns around to all the adopted children and he says, you know, because of my character and because of who I am, I'm going to take everything I have and I'm giving it to you. And we inherit the earth. Why? Because we earned it? No, Jesus earned it. He, he owns it doubly. And then he turns around, and to morons like me, he says, I give you everything. And we are told in the book of Revelation that we will reign and rule with Christ upon the earth forever. Right. But only if we're true servants. Right. Only true servants will get the possession. We will possess the land, but only if we're true servants, if we're, if we're people of action, faithfulness, if we're people who are humble and submissive, if we're people who are wise and live for Christ while he's gone from the earth. Now let's talk about the wicked servant. Point out three things about this wicked servant as well. Number one, he is condemned for a lack of faith. You may be wondering, when you look at the text, where does it say that he doesn't have faith? Where in the text does this wicked servant not have faith? But notice, his, notice the attitude of the so-called servant. Look at verse 48. But when the wicked servant says to himself, what does he say? Who 
in the world does this servant think he is that he has the right to say the master's delayed? He doesn't get to make, he is not the one who sets the timetable when the master, oh, you know what? He didn't come back when I think he should come back. <laughs> master's delayed. That's not faith. Faith is not saying, I set the timetable, and when he doesn't come back when I think he should come back, well, then therefore he is delayed. There's no lordship here. The only way that he could think the master is delayed is if he thinks he determines when the master should come back. He does not submit to the master's timing, but his own timing. He wants the master to conform to him, not the other way around. What is lordship? You rule over me. You tell me how things are supposed to go. Here this servant says, you're not doing it, my master's not doing it the way I think it needs to go. He's delayed. Well, according to who? According to you, he's delayed. There's no lordship there. There's no faith there. This is exactly what we see in our world today, is it not? People who want God, but only on their terms. Only on their terms. We want God. We want God. But only if God is going to conform to what we want. We want God if He conforms to what we want. That's the way our culture lives. We're seeing it all around us. Brother James mentioned the, the Supreme Court ruling this last week. Do you know there is a movement across this country of homosexual Christianity where you can be an open homosexual? I'm not talking, listen, we went through an entire series on homosexuality here. If you have any question where our church stands on how we should love people and care for people and, and what, what determines whether or not a person can be saved and not saved and deal with the issue of homosexuality, go listen to all the sermons. I got all my notes. I'll give them to you. However, when a person says, I am a homosexual, there is nothing wrong with it, and the Bible approves of me living this way. That is you taking God on your terms. That's right. Right. Yep. I love God, and by the way, let's just get even more personal. When you get married, a man and a woman get married, and at some point you decide, I don't want to be married to this person anymore. I, it's just not going how I thought. It's just harder than I thought. And I'll just get divorced and God will be perfectly fine with it. That is you saying to God, accept me on my terms. Right. You know, we're really good at amen and sin that we don't struggle with. Yeah. We are really good at it, aren't we? I'm great at it. Boy, I can amen stuff that I don't struggle with. That's the bad stuff over there. I'm the worst person I know. And if you're honest with yourself, you're the worst person you know. That's right. And you better be willing to say that. That's what Paul said about himself. Yeah. I'm the chief of sinners. And we look at Paul and say, how can Paul say this? It's because Paul knew Paul. Right. And I know me. And I'm really good at amen and things. But you know what, church? If we're going to be the faithful servant, we got to stop amen and things that we don't deal with, and we've got to start aiming in things that we deal with in our life and start saying to God, God, I want to be a person of action that is willing to be faithful in the way that I walk, and that means amen in the junk in my life, and let's get it out. Wow. Right. That's what it's going to take, church, for us to be what we're supposed to be. The problem is not out there. The problem is in me. Yeah. Right. I am my biggest problem. Mm -hmm. This flesh wants nothing good. Paul said it. There is nothing good in me that is in my flesh. Nothing. So any good that you do is a gift of God. It's a gift of God. But we live in a culture that takes God on their terms. As long as you let me do what I want, that's the God I believe in. That attitude gets condemned by God. Second thing that this wicked servant does is he is condemned for his pride. Look at verse 49. When he thinks the master is delayed, what does he start doing to his fellow servants? He starts beating them. 
Pride takes advantage of other people. Pride takes advantage of other people. Pride either sees people as in the way of what you want, or pride sees people and says, I can use them to get what I want. That's what pride does. This servant looked at his fellow servants and said, I'm better than you, and I can do to you what I want. That's the height of pride. It's dehumanizing other people. Other people created in the image of God. You use them and abuse them and do whatever you want to them because you think you're better than them. That's what this wicked servant does. He looks at his fellow servants as less than him. He thinks mistreating them is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. I could have, have, could have titled this subpoint condemned for a lack of love. He doesn't see other people as, as image bearers of God that should be loved. He sees them as objects to be used. He has such a polluted view of himself that there's no humility, no submission, but a desire to lord over others and, and treat them as he sees fit. And isn't that the process of what happens? When you're not willing to walk in, in, uh, underneath the lordship of Christ, who then is the Lord? You are. And guess how, ever, guess how everybody else should treat you? As if you're Lord. So when we don't submit to Christ and his lordship, we set ourselves up as Lord, and then we want everybody else to treat us as Lord. That's what he does here. My master's delay, according to my timetable. Doesn't he know when, when, I, when I expect him to be back? And then he turns to the servants and treats them with the same attitude. I, I'm, I'm over you. No humility here, no love. This is the very opposite of what Brother James talked about this morning. There's no thought of the golden rule here. This man doesn't say, how can I do good to these servants? How can I do good to my fellow servants? You know what? I don't have a great relationship with this one over here, but how can I do good to him? How can I love him and minister to him? How can I be humble myself to serve that one? There's none of that here. Once again, is this not what we see in our culture today? People using other people made in the image of God for their own benefit. It's what premarital sex is, by the way. It's what adultery is, by the way. You're not love, you don't love the other person. If you love the other person, you would not commit adultery. If you love the other person, you would not have premarital sex. Because that's not love. What you're doing is you're using them to fill something up in your own life. You're using other people. That's what our culture, but our culture just boasts about it. It's not, hey, wait till you're married to have sex. It's wait till you meet the right one that you love. No. You know what? Your, your husband's just not doing it for you. You know? I mean, he's just, he's just not, he doesn't look the way he used to look. He, he does, he's not as romantic as he used to be. And by the way, I'm 37 years old yesterday. I do not look the way I looked when, I, when Jessica married me at 23. I, hey, guys, I was in shape. I could, I could run and run and run and not get tired. If you said run to the bathroom right now, I'd pass out on the way. But a wife just doesn't decide one day, you know what? My husband's not doing it for me anymore. Maybe there's a m another man that will. All you're doing is using that other man to fill up your sinful void in your life. No love, no humility. And lastly, third thing, he's condemned for his indulgence. Verse 49 says, and he eats and drinks with drunkards. This is a way of Jesus saying he just indulges himself. He just fills up his flesh with anything that he can fill it up with. It's implied that he lives like the drunkards. This reveals to us that he is a person of indulgence. He lives to satisfy his sinful nature and not to honor the master in his behavior. My master's delayed. My master is gone. I can live however I please to make myself happy. 
This once again is what we see in our culture today. Indulgence is the name of the game. And if you dare to speak against anything that makes someone else happy, then you are a person of hate and intolerance. If you dare tell somebody that that's not good for you, then you hate them. Now, this is, after all, a, a study on um, the second coming. When we look at the wicked servant, we look around our culture today, we see a lack of faith, we see pride, and we see indulgence, maybe like you've never seen before in your life. Is that not true? Those of you who, who have lived longer than us young ones, my back hurt when I said that because my back knew I was lying. <laughs> You're, you're looking at this culture that you're in and you're saying, I've never seen wickedness like this before. Mm -hmm. And you know what the temptation for people in America who are looking at America deteriorate and get worse and worse and worse? You know what the temptation is for Christians as they look at this culture? They say, wow, there's a bunch of wicked servants. Jesus might be coming back soon. But isn't that the opposite of the point? Just to let you know, America is no different than any other culture that has ever existed. This is what unregenerate man does. Unregenerate man has no faith. The unregenerate man has pride that just oozes out of every pore of his being. The unregenerate man indulges himself. And just because we haven't seen it, by the way, this description of the wicked servant is the description of every unregenerate man who has ever lived. So don't look at America and say, America's getting really bad. Jesus is coming back soon. Every single, every single culture could say that about their culture. Every Christian group could say, man, Jesus, he's coming back soon. Look at these people. Because that is the nature of people. It is the nature of our depravity. This is how we act apart from Christ. And Jesus obviously does not want his hearers to think that when the wicked servants become more and more and more, then that means Jesus is coming back soon. Because he says about the wicked servant, he will come on a day that he does not expect and an hour that he does not know. That's simply an echo of what he has already said two or three times. Once we moved into verse 36, we've got three different occasions of Jesus saying, you do not know the hour, you do not know the time, you have no clue when I'm coming back, the saved person doesn't know it, and the wicked person doesn't know it. There's not signs and wonders you can point to to say, now he's coming. And the wicked person is going about his wickedness, and the master opens up the door. So the master's gone, the servant thinks, I can live however I want, showing that he's not a true servant. And in the midst of his pride and indulging and lack of faith, the master opens the door and enters in. And there's a destructive end that comes. What is the consequence for this wicked servant? Shocking statement. But when I first read this, I thought, what in the world? Jesus says, and he'll come at an hour that he does not know, verse 51, and will cut him in pieces. Wow. That's shocking. Jesus is going to come back and start cutting people up? What in the world? Well, this is actually a common biblical phrase. It is used, by the way, of all the animals that were sacrificed. It's a phrase used of the animals that were sacrificed. It is an execution term. It's an execution term. Jesus is saying, when the master comes back and finds that the servant is acting like this, the servant's dead. The servant is dead. He will be executed. You get Jesus' point, right? When I come back, the wicked will be put to an end. And you say, well, a final end? Like they're not going to exist anymore? No, because then he goes on and says, 
They'll be put in a place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is a death that just keeps going. It's like a never-ending death. They put in a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we know that's referring to hell, do we not? This is the final end to the wicked. Separation from the master and under his eternal judgment and wrath. So Jesus ends Matthew 24. Think about everything we've talked about over nine weeks. He starts off with the disciples asking this question. When are these things going to happen? They think the destruction of the temple and the end of the world go together. And Jesus begins to, to dialogue with them. Really, I mean, really, he's preaching a sermon and he says to them, well, you really got this wrong. First, let's deal with the temple. Here's all the signs. Here's the things you can point to. Here's the abomination of desolation, which will mirror what happened in, in Daniel. You'll see it happening. When it happens, you know to get out. You know that you need to be long gone because Jerusalem's going to fall, the temple's going to get destroyed, and the Christians believe that the Christians left. And Jesus says, so that's the answer to the first part. When will these things happen? And he says, but there's another thing that's going to happen that doesn't coincide with the temple's destruction, and it's my second coming. And remember he goes from plural these days to singular, that day, that hour. Now he's changing topics, and now he's saying, but as far as my coming, nobody knows. Nobody knows. No one has a clue when I'm coming back. And then he ends. Matthew 24 ends with Jesus saying, but let me tell you how to live while I'm gone. When I'm gone, here's how you live. You be about my kingdom. You be about serving my household. You be about the things that I'm telling you to be about. He doesn't just leave them and say, hey, I'm gone. Hope you guys do okay. I'm out. He says, no, no, no. While I'm gone, be faithful and wise. Be people of action. Be people of faithfulness. Be people of humility. Be people of love. Be about the kingdom of God while I am gone. I'm going to use you to expand the kingdom of God upon the earth. You're going to go and preach to every nation, every tribe, every tongue. They're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you go and you do what you're supposed to do so that when I come back, I find my children doing what they're supposed to be doing. We don't sit and look at the stars and the signs and go, oh, he's coming. Oh, he's coming. Oh, he's coming. No, you get your eyes off the skies and you get your eyes in the kingdom of God here upon the earth and you begin to live out how God has called you to live. So that when he comes back, he doesn't have us all chasing after signs and wonders. You know what he comes back to? A bunch of people living out the kingdom of God. That's what he comes back to. And by the way, guess what he's going to do? He's just going to consummate that kingdom upon the earth. He's going to come down wherever it is in the process as it's spreading on the earth and more people are getting saved and more people are getting saved and the kingdom is expanding upon itself. When Jesus comes back, he's going to consummate it all. And then the kingdom of God in all of its fullness and glory will be over the entire earth. You know, it's crazy. He's using us to expand the kingdom of God right now upon the earth. When you live out the kingdom of God with your family, you know what you're doing? You are expanding the kingdom. You are taking dominion over the earth. When I sit down with my family and we pray before we eat, guess what we're doing? We are expanding the kingdom of God upon the earth. We're taking dominion over the things that God has told us to take dominion over. And when Jesus comes back, he'll consummate all that. And then we will do it perfectly for all of eternity. The point of Matthew 24, the point of Jesus' teaching is to tell the disciples and everyone who would come after them that what we are supposed to be about is not trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. Right. It's not what we're supposed to be doing. What we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to have our head down in God's Word, following what He says to do, and live, being about the kingdom business upon the earth. That's what I, when Jesus comes back, that's what I want him to find me doing. Yeah, yeah, 
I want him to come back and say, Calvary Hill's doing it. Calvary Hill's doing it. And my prayer for myself first and for us as a church is that we will take these words to heart. I want to be the faithful and true servant. That's what I want to be. And that means God's got a lot of work to do with me. But that's what I desire. I don't want any cheap grace. I want to follow after the Lord. And my heart for us as a church is that, that that's all of our desire. That when Jesus comes back, he's going to find us about his kingdom. And he's going to say, blessed are you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You inherit everything. You get everything. And you know what we're not going to say on that day? We're not going to say, oh, Jesus, we did it for you. (laughs) We're going to say, you did it through us. Here's all our crowns at your feet. We'll be more aware of our weakness then than probably ever before. I hope that you have enjoyed our time in Matthew 24. I have thoroughly enjoyed studying and letting God work on me as I am preparing and um, as the Lord's been showing me what He would like to say each week. Um, I hope that I hope that we have learned more about eschatology, study of end things. But more importantly than that, I hope we have been challenged to be about the kingdom of God. That's what I hope we that if you say well, what what did you hope to accomplish with all this, Neil? I hope that all 8 weeks was a build up to week 9. So that week 9 we go that's what it's all about. Right.